Welcome to Thrive Church, everyone. We are so happy to have you here with us. My name is Judah Thomas, and I'm the lead pastor here at Thrive. One church, several locations, but we are glad to have you wherever you are, New Britain, Torrington, Terryville, online. We welcome you. So we are in our series, Nerves of Steel. And, and throughout this, we've been studying uh, the, the life of Daniel, and it's all really about how to stand strong in the face of of adversity, how to stand strong when we're facing difficult circumstances. We face many difficulties in our families, at school, in work, and this inspires us to stand strong, to have nerves of steel. And this has all been about uh, Daniel, who was a prophet from the Old Testament. Um, this was long before Jesus was on the scene. He was basically kidnapped. He was exiled with thousands of other Jews, brought to Babylon, and some of them were elevated to positions of high honor, as was Daniel. Um, the interesting thing is we've been talking about Daniel, but it's also really been about this other guy, Nebuchadnezzar, who is the king of Babylon during at least the first sections that we've been studying. And, and we've been seeing Nebuchadnezzar all throughout it, and it's almost as if God is pursuing King Nebuchadnezzar. We see that, that he had a dream uh, 40 years prior to what we're talking about today, a dream of, of a, a statue. And we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. The statue had a head of gold and um, a you know, chest of silver. And it kind of incrementally goes down the statue of, of uh, different materials that are less value and less durability. And so he has this dream. And then uh, about 20 years after that, um, he erects this big, you know, statue, demands everyone to fall down and worship it or they're going to get thrown in the fiery furnace. We talked about this last week, but three men stood strong, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were thrown into the fiery furnace, but they were unharmed. And they came out and Nebuchadnezzar began to realize that this God that they worshiped was a God of power. And then now he has a, a new dream and it's like God is continuing showing and demonstrating his power to Nebuchadnezzar, much like he is demonstrating and showing his power to each and every one of us. But we're going to start off here in Daniel chapter 4, verse 1. It says, King Nebuchadnezzar sent this message to the people of every race and nation and language throughout the world. So he's sending out a letter, a proclamation to everyone in the known world. He was the world power at the time, and he's sending this out. And, and it's, listen to what he says here. He says, peace and prosperity to you. I want you all to know about the miraculous signs and wonders the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how powerful his wonders, his kingdom will last forever, his rule through all generations. Now, this is very interesting uh, on several levels. And, and the first thing that stands out to me is just in the chapter before, he was threatening to kill anybody who wouldn't bow down and worship his statue. And now here he is proclaiming that God is the true king, that God reigns over the entire world. The other thing that's interesting to me is that this chapter is written not by Daniel, but by King Nebuchadnezzar. The, maybe you didn't realize that Nebuchadnezzar wrote a part of the Bible and, and what he wrote here must have been so impactful in that day that Daniel said, hey, I'm going to take this proclamation and I'm going to include it in my own writings. So here, Nebuchadnezzar has written this thing down. Daniel adds it into his book and this just demonstrates how God was pursuing King Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, he wasn't even a Jew. He was a Gentile. He was king over the Babylonian empire. And for the past 40 years, God had been trying to get his attention. Many of us can attest to that in our own lives. God trying to get our attention. 
through doing different things and showing his power and by bringing people across our path and us going through circumstances, many of which are not good, but God is trying to get our attention. As evil and as bad as Nebuchadnezzar may have been, God was pursuing him. God wanted to have a relationship with him as God is pursuing each and every one of us. Have you ever felt like God was pursuing you? Like he was drawing you? Maybe that's why you're even here today because you feel that God was drawing you. Maybe someone invited you. Maybe you came with a friend or a family member. Maybe you've been exploring for a little bit of time and you're not quite sure why. And it's because God is pursuing you that he's drawing you into his family. Because, in your notes, God pursues us because he loves us. See, God wants a relationship with you and with you and with me. God wants a relationship with each and every one of us and he pursues us by his spirit and draws us to him. So here we see King Nebuchadnezzar who has been pursued by God for many years and he sends out an official document to everyone in the known world at that time and the entire kingdom proclaiming the glory of God. This king is telling about the Most High. He's sharing his faith. He's witnessing. I believe the most powerful witness that we can be in this world is when we share what God has done in our life. When we tell the story of what God has done, how he's brought healing, how he's brought restoration, how he's brought freedom from our shame and from our addiction, from our past. See, when we tell this story, it makes an impact. And that's what Nebuchadnezzar was doing here. He was telling the world about how how great his God was. But what made him do this? Like what brought him to this? Like, like the last we saw, like he was going off the handle because people weren't worshiping his statue. And here he is saying, this God is king over all. What brought him to the point of claiming, not claiming that he was God any longer? He saw himself previously as a God, a God king. People would worship him. They would worship the gods that he said to worship. What brought him to this point? It starts with another dream. And it was a dream that scared him. Perhaps you've had a dream like that before. Wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat, much like what Nebuchadnezzar did. He woke up and he was terrified of the dream that he had. He didn't understand it, but he thought there must be some significance to this dream. So he orders his magicians, his enchanters, his astrologers, his fortune tellers to all gather around and he would tell them the dream, but they were unable to to interpret it. Now what they would do is, is they would have books kind of like this. This is the dream interpretation handbook, except theirs is probably on, on scrolls and, and they would kind of flip through and, and say, like, okay, let's see here. Um, so your dream had a, had a pig in it. Okay. Pigs are considered dirty animals that roll around in the muck. This is what the pigs represent in our dreams. Filth the willingness to roll around in the mud. So if you have a dream of a pig, like that's most likely what, it, what, what they're saying it's gonna mean. Oh, uh, here, let's see what else. Um, here's another one. If you have a dream of an escalator, perhaps, okay? I'm reading right out of this book here, okay? An, escal an escalator shows movement from one level of consciousness to another. The thoughts and ideas are up the next level of consciousness. I mean, that's beautiful, isn't it? Okay, let's see, let's, let's do one more. Uh, lice, okay, um... If you have a dream about lice, we associate lice with being dirty. We associate them with deep discomfort, right? Okay, yeah. They may re represent guilt over behaving without integrity or suggest your behavior and the choices make you deeply uncomfortable. Like, you're like, man, this whole talk of lice does make me uncomfortable. And that's kind of what these guys would do. They would have these scrolls and he would say, oh, I dreamed of a, of a, you know, of a fish. And they would pull up the fish. They're like, oh, okay, here's what it is. And, and so they would do that. But these were very loose, very general statements. But on this one, they're saying, they're either saying we don't know or they're saying, you know what? It's so bad that we don't want to tell you. One way or the other, they cannot interpret this dream because ultimately they have no power. They have no power. So, so King Nebuchadnezzar finally calls Daniel in. I don't know why he didn't start there. 
Daniel had success interpreting dreams before, but most likely because Daniel had been elevated to such a high prominence in the kingdom that the king probably didn't want to bother him with this concern at the time. Daniel was ruling over the entire province of Babylon. He was an important, important person, but the king is desperate, so he orders Daniel to come in and to talk to him about this dream. So Nebuchadnezzar, the first time he had a dream, if you recall a couple weeks ago, Nebuchadnezzar didn't tell anyone what the dream was. He wanted to prove if they actually could interpret it by making them also tell him the dream. He was being a little tricky there, but he doesn't do that this time. He's just very open. He tells the dream and he knows that Daniel's God is the only one who can reveal the interpretation, reveal the meaning of this dream. He knows that Daniel has a connection with a God, a holy God, a powerful God. And so Nebuchadnezzar, while he finds his identity in his worth and his accomplishments, he knows that Daniel finds his identity in his God. So picking up here in verse seven of Daniel four, when all the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and fortune tellers came in, I told them the dream. Again, this is Nebuchadnezzar speaking. I told them the dream, but they could not tell me what it meant. At last, Daniel came in before me and I told him the dream. He was named Belteshazzar after my God. And the spirit of the holy gods is in him. I mean, how disrespectful was that even of the king to rename Daniel, which was a Hebrew name that glorified the God of, that we worship, the God in heaven, to, to this Belteshazzar, worshiping this God, Bel. And here Nebuchadnezzar was saying, my God was Bel, but I respect Daniel's God too. He was what we call a polytheist. In other words, he kind of worshiped many gods. He really had no deep convictions. He's like, well, whatever is good for you is good for you. And, and that's how he rolled. And so he said, my God is Bell, but Daniel's got some other God. I don't know. And basically what, what's going on here is, is King Nebuchadnezzar knew a little bit about God, but he had not fully decided to submit his life to God. In your notes, you can know a lot about God and still not be surrendered to him. Many of us, we know a lot about God, but have we truly surrendered our lives to him? Maybe you read scripture, you come to church on occasion. You know the Bible stories because you went to children's church as a kid and you saw the flannel graph and you did the little, you know, coloring books and, and you did all these things. You paint by number and all this stuff and Noah in the ark and Jonah in the whale and all these great things. Oh, I know a little bit about God, but, but we don't fully have a relationship with God. Nebuchadnezzar knew some about God, but was not living a life surrendered to God, but God wanted Nebuchadnezzar just as God wants you and his family. So Nebuchadnezzar tells Daniel the dream. This is what the dream was. He says, I had a dream that there was a tree in the middle of the earth and it grew tall and it grew strong and it reached up so high that the entire world could see this tree and all of its branches. And on the branches were these beautiful green leaves and, and it was loaded with an abundance of fruit for everyone to eat. And, and wild animals would come and, and they would be under its shade and, and birds would nest in the branches of this massive tree. And the entire world was fed from the fruit of this tree. But then a messenger came from heaven. So this is an angelic being in his dream. This messenger comes and shouts out, cut down the tree and lob off all of its branches, chop off the branches, shake off all of the leaves and scatter the fruit away, chase away the animals and chase away the birds, but leave the stump and the roots in the ground. And they'll be bound by a band of iron and brass and then let him live and be drenched with dew. Let him live with the wild animals among the plants in the fields until seven periods of time have come. Let him have the mind of a wild animal instead of the mind of a human. And this is what was decreed by this angelic messenger so that everyone would know the most high rules over the kingdoms of the earth. And he gives the kingdoms to anyone 
that he chooses. And this is the dream that Nebuchadnezzar retells to Daniel. But Daniel, hearing the dream, the interpretation becomes very clear. And he begins to be a little bit afraid of giving this interpretation. After 40 years of being in the service of this king, he's actually kind of grown fond of the guy. You know, he's been there for 40 years. Now, sure, he was taken away. He was kidnapped. He was brought hundreds of miles away from his family, from his home. He was brought to a new kingdom, but he was elevated to positions of honor. The king trusted him and he trusted the king. And, and, and he even says to the king, you know, I wish that this punishment was for your enemies instead of for yourself. And he doesn't really want to tell the king, but Daniel has nerves of steel. He's like, but I'm going to tell you what it means. I'm going to tell you. Now, now we got to realize that, that if he's telling the king a, an interpretation that the king didn't like, the king had it in his power to have Daniel executed. He says, I don't like what you have to say. And we have seen that happen in other situations across the Bible. And so Daniel, he boldly tells the king what this means. He says, the tree, Nebuchadnezzar, is you. You are that tree growing strong and growing great. Your rule goes to the ends of the earth. See, Nebuchadnezzar, he was a proud king. And he thought that he was responsible for his success, for his glory. If you've ever studied ancient Babylon, you know that it was a beautiful city. Some of the, the amazing wonders there. They had the hanging gardens. They had aqueducts. Nebuchadnezzar was responsible for building numerous temples and they'd have columns overlaid with gold. I mean, this was a magnificent place, but God is now decided to humble him and show Nebuchadnezzar who the real world power is. He says, you think you're strong? Here, I'm gonna show you the real world power. And Daniel says that he was gonna be sentenced to living seven years as an animal. Look what it says here in verse 25 of Daniel 4. Daniel says, you'll be driven from human society and you'll live in the fields with the wild animals. You'll eat grass like a cow and you'll be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven periods of time. Now we don't exactly know what these seven periods of time, if it was seven weeks, seven months, seven seasons, seven years, but most kind of agree that it was probably seven years. So seven periods of time will pass while you live this way until you learn, until you learn, King Nebuchadnezzar, that the Most High rules over the kingdoms of the world and gives them to anyone he chooses. But the stump and the roots of the tree were left in the ground. This means that you will receive your kingdom back again when you have learned that heaven rules. King Nebuchadnezzar, please accept my advice. Now he's turning to Nebuchadnezzar as a friend. He says, please accept my advice. Stop sinning and do what is right. Break from your wicked past and be merciful to the poor. Perhaps then you'll continue to prosper. Maybe God will forgive you. Maybe God will change your mind. Maybe you won't have to go through all of this. Has this dream of the tree cut down. The stump is bound with iron and bronze and most likely that was because it would protect the stump against pests and, and splitting which could lead to, to the stump rotting and decomposing. And even though this tree was chopped down, God was still protecting it. And even when God allows things to happen in our life, things that may develop our character, sometimes these things are unpleasant, they're painful. Let me tell you, God still loves you and protects you. Even when it seems like God is cutting things away at us in our life, when it feels like our whole world is falling apart, God still loves us and protects us. And that's what's going on here in this dream. God is saying, I'm gonna cut you down, but I will restore your kingdom. So Daniel though, he gives Nebuchadnezzar a chance to repent. To repent is to, you're going one way and you stop and you turn around, you go the other way. He said, well, won't you stop? Won't you repent? Won't you, won't you change your ways? Change your way before this dream plays out. Maybe God will be merciful to you. But unfortunately, King Nebuchadnezzar did not take this warning seriously. He had a chance. Are you being warned in your own life? Maybe there's something 
that's on the horizon, a calamity, a difficulty, something and God is, is warning you, saying it's time for you to repent, to stop, to turn around, to go the other way. It's time for you to turn from these ways before it's too late. Are we being warned? But Nebuchadnezzar, he allowed pride to consume him. In your notes, God will humble us if we refuse to humble ourselves. He will humble you if you refuse to humble yourself. See, God gives us the option, says, hey, I'm gonna humble you, but hey, guess what? You can do it yourself first. You can humble yourself. And you know what? If I can do it myself, that's always better than allowing God to bring humility into my life. And it's only 12 months later, only 12 months later, and Nebuchadnezzar is wandering around like, look what I did. It was all me. You know, I'm pretty good after all. Look what he says here in verse 29 of chapter 4. 12 months later, he was taking a walk on the flat roof of the royal palace in Babylon. As he looked out across the city, remember how beautiful the city was. It was magnificent. And he said, look at this great city of Babylon. By my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. Man, this guy is full of himself. He's like, look what I've done. Now, this kind of grates against us. We don't like to hear people talking like that. And yet, how often do we do these very same things? Look, I brought myself up. I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. Look what I've accomplished. Look at the, the degree that I have, the job that I have, the home that I live in. Look what I have accomplished in life. And while these words were still in his mouth, verse 31, a voice called out from heaven, O Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. You are no longer ruler of this kingdom. And in that moment, in that moment, within the next hour, he began to live like a beast and eat the grass to learn that God was the king. To learn that God was the one who rules the world. To learn that, that God gives the kingdoms of this world to whomever he pleases. In your notes, there is a God in heaven and you are not him. <laughs> Sometimes we think we are. We try to act like we are, but you are not God. Nebuchadnezzar was not God. We do not have the ability to choose right from wrong. We do not have the ability to say what is correct and what is incorrect. We do not have the ability to determine what is sinful and what is not sinful. These things belong to God alone. The government thinks that they can tell us what sin is and what it isn't, but guess what? They don't have the power either. Only God in heaven has the power to be God. No one else has this power. In that hour, the dream was fulfilled and King Nebuchadnezzar went wild. It's called clinical zoanthropy. This is, this is where you think that you're an animal and you begin to act like an animal. And he was driven outside. And the Bible says he ate grass like a cow. I know this is utterly ridiculous, right? <laughs> sorry, uh, I'll just move on from there. Um, yeah, sorry, had to throw in some jokes there. Um, here he is living like this. Now, we don't know if he was actually just like sent out like, hey, good luck, fend for yourself. Or more likely, maybe he was kept somewhere so he would be safe. Uh, some people even speculate that Daniel may have been his caretaker during this time watching over him. But he was wild as an animal. He ha did not have the mental capacity to be the king, the ruler anymore. And it says that he lived that way until his hair was long like eagle feathers and his nails were like bird claws. In chapter 34, I'm sorry, verse 34 of chapter four. It says, after this time passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven. Looked up to heaven. Where do we see him before? We saw him on the top of his temple, looking down upon all that he did. He was elevating himself, looking down on everything he did. He says, look what I've done. This is all for my splendor. Look at all the great things I've done. He was full of pride. He was full of arrogance. And here he says, after the time passed, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven and my sanity returned. And I praised and worshiped the Most High and honored the one who lives forever. His rule is everything and his kingdom is eternal. Verse 37, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and glorify and honor the king of heaven. All his acts are just and true, and he 
is able to humble the proud. He says, now I, King Nebuchadnezzar, I no longer praise myself. I no longer look to myself as being so great and so powerful and so mighty. Now I look and I see that God is king over all. God is ruler over all. All of his acts are just and true. He's able to humble the proud. And I was so proud, but he brought me down low. But Nebuchadnezzar, he could have avoided the humiliation He could have avoided the hardship. He could have avoided the struggle if he had just turned to God earlier. If he had just repented when when Daniel had challenged him, if he just stopped and turned around and said, I'm not gonna go that way anymore. I'm not gonna gonna pursue my own ambition. I'm gonna pursue God. And as a result of Nebuchadnezzar's pride, God began to resist Nebuchadnezzar. God was fighting against him. Do you want God to oppose you? Do you want God to fight against you? Do you want God to set himself against you? Do you want God to come against you? See, we see stories like this and we kind of, like if truth be made known, we kind of like it when God brings down the proud, right? Like if there's somebody, you're like, they're like, they're so proud and and they kind of get knocked down a size. We're kind of like, yeah, they had it coming to them, right? Like we kind of like that. We kind of like when God knocks down the proud, except when it's us, Right? Like, I don't mind seeing you get knocked down to size, but I don't want to get cut down to size. I don't want that to happen to me. But it's important for us to realize, as it was important for Nebuchadnezzar to realize that we do not come to God as equals. We don't come to him as equals, telling him what to do. Say, oh, you know what? You know, God is just lucky to have me on his team. Man, I am just, I'm just such a, a great person. And man, God should be so proud to have me. No, that is pride. We need to come to God humbly as a servant. Because in your notes, pride is a barrier to blessings. Maybe you've been praying for things or looking for things and wondering why God has not been blessing certain things in your life. This is the first place to look is, is pride blocking your relationship with God? Because it's always better for us to humble ourselves than for God to step in and do it. As it says in James 4, 6, for God opposes the proud, but favors the humble. Nowhere else does the Bible say that God opposes you. It says that God is for us, that he's drawing us, that he's enticing us, that he loves us. But here it says that God opposes He resists, he sets his face against the proud. And yet, many of us wear pride like a badge of honor as Nebuchadnezzar did. Look what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. Look what I have become. God opposes the proud, but favors the humble. See, pride is the biggest obstacle to a relationship with God. When I start thinking, I don't need God, I can do this on my own. I don't need God's forgiveness. I'm okay as I am. I don't need God's correction, his guidance. I don't need this. I'm okay as I am. Pride is the biggest obstacle that we face. And you can choose today to walk in humility before God or God will humble you. As he did with Nebuchadnezzar, he humbled him, he cut him down to size. If you find in your life, it feels like God is resisting you, maybe we need to explore pride. Maybe I've allowed pride to gain control of my life. The problem with pride is this, is it's very, very difficult to self-diagnose. In fact, even now, as I'm talking about pride, some of you are saying, you know what? I really don't have a problem with pride at all. I'm pretty good. That's the first clue. See, because it's hard to self-diagnose. Oh, I don't have pride. You know, I'm I'm really humble. In fact, I'm the most humble person I know. In fact, people should learn how to be humble for me. I'm just so proud of how humble I am. And we miss the humility that God has for us. See, repentance is a change of heart that leads to a change of lifestyle. And many of us, that's what we need to do. We're pursuing pride. We're pursuing our own selfish dreams and desires and ambitions. And God is inviting us to repent, to turn from those things and turn to Him. And with everything that's gone on in your life, with everything that you've done, with everything that you've accomplished, what and who are you pointing to? Are you pointing to yourself 
are you pointing to God? See, Nebuchadnezzar had been pointing to himself, but by the end, he was pointing to God, saying, you know what? I didn't have the power I thought I had. I didn't have the capacity I thought I did. It's God and God alone. He's the one who gives, the one who takes away. He's the one who humbles the proud. He's the one who elevates the humble. He is the one true living God. And even when your life feels like it is getting cut down, let me assure you that God loves you, He's protecting you, and He's pursuing you. But He wants us to humble ourselves, to learn the humility, so that we can have the same attitude that Jesus Christ had, who was humble, who uh, submitted Himself to God, and then let God lift us up. Let us not be the ones who are constantly lifting ourselves up. Let us lift up the name of our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And we thank you for your many blessings. We thank you for your word, which teaches us. We thank you for your word, which inspires us. And we ask you to remove the pride within our hearts, Lord. Remove the pride that is holding us back. Remove the pride that is causing you to resist us, O oh Lord. For we know that you resist the proud and give grace to those who are humble. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord, Scripture says anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Will you call on his name? So that if you believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, and you say with your mouth, Jesus, you are my Lord, that you'll be saved. Won't you call on his name now? Wherever you are, won't you call on his name? Say, Jesus, you are my Lord. It takes an act of humility. It takes an act of saying, you know what? I don't got it all together. I thought I had it all together. I thought I could handle it.